You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode number 209. Today, we're talking about healthy family eating with Liz Weiss. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Membership, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome! Welcome back, my friend. How are you? I hope that you are doing well. I'm so excited for you to join me at the table talking to Liz Weiss, and she's a registered dietitian, mom of two, and she's this cookbook author, and she's the host of Liz's Healthy Table podcast. And she helps, you know, spend her career teaching busy families, parents and kids, how to get healthy and affordable meals at the table at home. So I know that, you know, many of us struggle to get our kids to eat a healthy diet. And so this podcast is about helping and showing everyone how to eat more fruits and vegetables and how to create healthy, sustainable rules for the table. So I hope this will all help us feel better physically and mentally and everything. Um, Some takeaways I want you to listen for, you know, it's fascinating. 90% of, of U.S. consumers don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. And um, we are we are more microbiome than we are human. This has been really fascinating. Something I've been very interested in in my own life. And that wonderful tried and true rule that is so powerful. You know, as far as parenting goes, you decide what, where, and when, and your child decides if and how much. Really wonderful. So um, I can't wait for you to dive into this episode quickly before we dive in. I want to invite you to the Mindful Mama Retreat. The spring retreat is happening on March 21st in Philadelphia. Uh, It's a day-long retreat and it will include meditation and some yoga. Um, It will include your, your lunch, actually, considering this is a podcast about lunch it will include a vegetarian lunch and um and it's always really wonderful it's an amazing time to take this time give this time to ourselves to really um dive into deep into uh, ourselves and connect in a really mindful wonderful way this is what um, some past participants has sa- have said this is what leela said she said to me Thank you for such a wonderful experience, Hunter. It's amazing how a day can fly by while meditating, doing yoga, feeling, thinking, and talking with other moms. I really appreciate the sense of community, calm, and acceptance you created here today. A place where we could feel free to be vulnerable and to share our truth without fear of judgment. I needed this, and I'm sure my family did too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really wonderful. There are other great responses. If you're interested in getting one of the limited spots available, go right now to mindfulmamamentor.com slash retreat. And I will look forward to hanging with you IRL. One more thing before we dive in today. I'm so happy this week to welcome sponsors to the podcast. And this is really wonderful new development because it's going to allow me and my team to continue to bring you the amazing guests and conversations you've come to know and love. I invite you to really welcome them too. Also know that I am very particular about who I bring in to sponsor this podcast. I've rejected quite a few. So please support the sponsors and use the promo codes. That way we can continue beautifully into the future. All right, well now let's dive into this episode with Liz Weiss. Liz, thanks so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you because you are like, are like the guru of getting healthy eating for for kids and families and things like that. And and I'm just wondering, like, how did you uh, how did you get 
started? Like what, what got you so passionate about this? Did you, did you grow up like in a family of Twinkie eaters? <laughs> I grew up in a family where we did eat Twinkies, I will admit that. And my favorite food in the world was Mallow Mar cookies, which, you know, have chocolate and marshmallows. It's kind of like a s'more in a box. But my mother was a home ec teacher, home economics teacher back in the day. And she um, would teach kids how to cook in elementary school. So she was a great home cook. And I just took this early interest in cooking and I would sort of hang out at her apron strings in the kitchen. And I just always loved cooking. I always loved food. I always say I'm one of the first foodies. I was a foodie before we had the term foodie. And then I just was so weird. I just, I don't know, I decided I'm going to go to college and study nutrition. And I did. And that just sort of started this career um, in food and nutrition. And then I got a degree in the culinary arts and kind of combined the two. I've never been like a chef in a restaurant, but I am a, a cookbook author. So I just, you know, as I had kids, I just sort of got tunneled into this, this family nutrition area because I had my own children. I was talking to other parents at the playground and this struggle with food and nutrition was just so prevalent. And this is, my kids are now 20 and 24. So this is, you know, two decades ago, but people were desperate for ideas and answers. So that's kind of how I just ended up evolving into the whole family nutrition space. It, it seems like such a like fraught area to me because like, okay, so maybe you can disabuse me of some notions I have because <laughs> in my mind, it seems like whatever they're teaching in, you know, maybe nutritionists or, or people who go into sort of like um, uh, mainstream medical nutrition seems crazy out of whack with all this knowledge there that's out there about uh, plant-based diets and but then also like about whole foods and and eating uh, and things like that like the you know and about um, our, our gut bacteria and all the all the knowledge that there is now about like the importance of our of our gut health and all of this stuff like there's all these sort of radical nutrition people in my mind like this is this is just like this, you have to completely take all of this with a grain of salt because this is just like kind of how I view the sort of this world. There's all these like people kind of at this sort of like cutting edge who are saying like all the things the the mainstream is doing is is, is wrong. So I, tell me a little bit about kind of where where your where your angle is in this mm -hmm. whole crazy world right now. Well, I have seen a huge amount of evolution in the nutrition world over the last three decades. My career, you know, I became a dietitian and. Ooh, 1984, I'm going to date myself, but it does feel like just yesterday. And we know so much more now. So I always tell people, you know, just think about how people have eaten over the millennia, like traditional diets, and go to places like the Mediterranean or go to places like Asia and just look at what they have been eating all along. And what they've been eating all along is really what we should be eating now. So if you look at the Mediterranean, for example, that's kind of the direction I tend to go in with my family. It's lots of fruits and vegetables. It's lots of whole grains, lots of nourishing seafood, lots of um, nuts and seeds. And yes, oh, and healthy oils, obviously from olive oil and avocados. So the way they eat that there and the way they've eaten for forever almost is, is really how you should be eating today. And if you eat that kind of a diet, mostly plant-based, but you can have the occasional hamburger, then it's going to nourish your body. It's going to nourish your microbiome. That's all the good bacteria that live in your gut. And I think, you know, when you look at a lot of mainstream doctors, they're not trained in nutrition, but dietitians are. And the dietetics community is really moving towards this plant-based diet style, this lifestyle. I will say there's a little bit of a caveat. It's so interesting. When you talk about the plant-based diet trend, you mm -hmm. think, oh my gosh, consumers must be eating so many fruits and vegetables. But the data show that people still struggle. 90% of US consumers do not eat enough fruits and vegetables, even though they're heading towards this plant-based style of eating. So what I'm trying to say is that a veggie burger might be a plant-based way to go, and that's great, but that's not getting you any closer to eating more fruits and vegetables. So when you think about plant-based, think about fruits and vegetables first. If half your plate is fruits and veggies, you are well on your way 
to good nutrition. So that's a long circuitous answer, mm-hmm. but I will say that I think dietitians, at least the dietitians I hang out with, are really embracing what you were talking about, which is all that progressive, innovative stuff, you know, the plant based, the microbiome, kind of getting back to basics, the wholesome, less heavily processed foods. Well, it should be interesting too to see what happens now as we start to learn more and more about like our. US, our genome and people are doing like the genome mapping and things like that, like the bio individuality mm-hmm. stuff, right? Like it's so interesting, like at least for me and my own family, because I was semi vegetarian for a decade and I'm not anymore now because I, I know I decided that it, it was for ethical reasons. And, and I would really like to, I would love to be vegetarian. Like I would just feel so much better, like as a, a, a being in the world, if I was not like, being part of like eating other like animals, mm-hmm. but, um, but my body doesn't do that well, like on some of the protein sources and my husband's body like does really badly. And he just like, doesn't even do well with like grains and things like that. So like, it's just really, it's so, it, I don't know. The whole thing is like a big question mark sometimes in my mind, except for that one, that piece, you know, like that, like, okay, if I can eat more vegetables and fruits, then that's, that's really, mm-hmm. that's really the place to start. So, But you're so right. I mean, it really is about the individual. So I look at my husband who eats a lot of seafood. He's a pescatarian, does not eat beef or chicken or pork. He can't seem to digest it. And believe me, when he has a piece of meat, I'm like, Ooh, did you just eat some meat earlier today? You can tell it just doesn't digest. We all do great on grains in our household but it's that meat piece. I can eat meat. My kids can eat meat. He cannot. So we're, we tend to be pescatarians around here, but I'll agree with you that the future of nutrition is this individualized approach. And some people figure it out on their own, just trial and error, but it down the road in the future, yeah, I think we'll be able to figure out what is your genetic makeup and what kind of diet works best for you. But at the end of the day, you want to have a healthy microbiome. You want the gut bacteria to thrive. And for that, for those bacteria to be really healthy in terms of diversity and in terms of numbers, you got to eat a lot of fruits and veggies because those bacteria eat fiber and fiber is found in fruits and veggies and whole grains and nuts and seeds. So that's another reason why you want to eat that type of a diet because you're feeding your gut and you are Hello, listeners, you are more microbial than you are human, meaning you have more of these little bacteria, more genetic DNA from bacteria than you do your human cells. It's so, it's like this this wild west, right? People, the scientists are just starting to understand it. It's such cool stuff. It it really is fascinating. And we are going to talk about how to bring some of these ideas like into our family's diet and things like that. But I have to just share with you, Liz, my personal like diet thing that happened with me because which is so interesting because it drives me bananas because so I think I'm pretty sure like I found out basically when I was 34 that I was allergic to dairy. But basically I'm pretty sure I was allergic to dairy my whole life. And um I, you know, when I was a kid, I I was forced to drink milk at dinner and and to but I like ne- I didn't even like cheese on pizza. I didn't like macaroni and cheese. I hated drinking the milk at dinner. I it was like something that was like forced on me that I had to do. And I, I was always like a mouth breather at night. I could, uh, and like it's funny you look back at my pictures of me and like my face was like so much rounder. Like I was definitely just You're kind inflamed. of puffy, right? mm-hmm. yeah. Like and I had I thought I had psoriasis because I had patches of skin that was that was like all dry and I had dandruff and stuff like that and then I had some a friend who went through the Institute of Integrative Nutrition I met with I met her in New York for something I thought oh I know it would probably make me a little less phlegmy if I didn't drink milk I, I said I'll try like putting like almond milk or something in my cereal and I did and I felt so much better like I was like whoa and then I just got rid of all the dairy cuz I started feeling better and and I didn't need to take naps anymore. My dandruff cleared up. My skin cleared up. I could breathe at night. Like I looked different. Like it was amazing. That is incredible. Like when you see that huge result from giving up that food group, but it sounds like you replaced it with other things, right? So you're doing calcium fortified almond milk, right? Do you do some of those non-dairy cheeses? Like what, how do you, how did you replace it? Well, um, 
I, yeah, I do almond milk and stuff like that. And I think as far as calcium, like I get that more from like uh, kale. I do a lot of green smoothies. And mm-hmm. so I, I have Love kale those. those and, and I do broccoli and stuff like that, which I know is a good source of um, calcium. But um, but yeah, uh, and it just, just makes me so angry because I'm like, they still in the pediatrician's office ask my daughter, do you drink milk? <laughs> I'm like, but there are so many human beings who don't do well on milk. And probably one of these children is, might be one of them. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. We are supported by Yoga Sleep, and I am so happy they are supporting the podcast because sleep is so important. As far as lowering our stress response, sleep is one of the number one things that we can do, and it is incredibly important to me. And yet this is sleep deprivation is this real thing that parents, we all know too well. And restorative sleep is crucial to our overall health yet it can be really elusive. So actually when my when we were looking for help with our daughter when she was a baby, my husband went and did research and found the best white noise machine he could possibly find and it happened to be the dome from the Yoga Sleep Company. And that was years ago and now they're supporting the podcast. The dome is an amazing product. It works so well. The sound is beautiful. But they also have these other white noise machines that now my daughters are fighting over with 16 different noises. They love them. They keep going back and forth between their rooms. And they have travel white noise machines. So for better sleep, for if you have a baby or if you have kids, you just want to have some beautiful, relaxing sounds in your home. And Yoga Sleep, they started in 1962. They invented the original sound conditioner. And all their products are backed by a 101-night promise, meaning that you can try them totally risk-free. I invite you to go to yogasleep.com slash hunter, and you're going to get to save an exclusive 20% off a sound machine for a natural sleep for the whole family. That's yogasleep.com slash hunter to get 20% off yogasleep.com slash hunter. Well, I think, you know, the the key is really to find something to replace it with. I'm not like a big fan of giving up an entire food group, but if you have to, you have to. And then what do you replace it with? You know, you can do some of the soy products. You can do the calcium fortified nut milks. You can do calcium fortified orange juice. And you know you're you're a woman, and you want your bones to be strong, and so you might take a supplement with some calcium in it. So you always sort of have to think about, all right, if I take out, like if I take out grains, why am I taking them out? And do you really have to take them out? Or if you're going gluten free, are there are gluten free grains you can eat to still have the benefit of all those healthy grains, all those healthy carbs? You know, those are good carbs. And so it's like a give and take, right? It's always, you know, I have a friend who's an expert in IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. And she's an expert in this diet called the low FODMAP diet. FODMAP. A, My FODMAP. husband tried the FODMAP thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it, that's a hard one, but that's a lot of people hard. do really well when they give up the FODMAP foods and then you can slowly introduce them back. But it's, it's a real process, but you have to figure out your personal health, your body. How do you react to different foods? And once you can kind of fine tune it, and you make sure you're covering all your bases, you're getting all the good nutrition, getting all that good fiber, then you're good to go. But it's for some people, it's quite a journey. And it sounds like you were kind of, you struggled there for, for quite some time. I did. I did. It, yeah. So, okay. Enough about me though. I want to talk. It's all so about it, you, lady. Come on. <laughs> so if 90% of US consumers are not getting enough fruits and vegetables, this is a major problem. And definitely this is, I mean, Probably like in my family, we, you know, we eat pretty well, but I definitely see when I go to the pool and there's just like so much pizza being consumed and so few vegetables and all different kinds of things. Like I definitely, it seems like there's, you know, from casually observing other people, like there's a lot fewer vegetables and, and fruits being eaten. So the, this starts young, right? Like this starts when our kids are younger. This starts with our own habits, I imagine. And I'm just trying to think about like what, Liz, if we could think about like what are some best practices for mm-hmm. families? And yeah. 
this is a, a topic I love talking about. So if we know that you're not getting enough fruits and veggies, the question is, how do we get more on our plates? And so you start by with this benchmark, and that is that half your plate should be filled with fruits and vegetables. So, you know, you sit down to a meal, uh, visualize half the plate. You've got your grains, you've got your protein, but then you have your fruit and you have your vegetables. And so why do we want to eat all these fruits and veggies? Well, we talked about it. They're really good for your health, good for your heart, good for cancer prevention, good for your gut. I can go on and on. Good for your body weight, right? And we know behaviorally when people eat lots of fruits and veggies, they feel happier. They yeah. feel proud. I mean, how happy I am, like the proudest mom in the world when my kids are like gobbling up, you know, kale chips or something I've made or a beautiful salad. So we feel great mentally. We feel better physically, but how do we do it? And so you use the word, the magic word, which is a habit. You want to make it more of a habit. You know, the, the more often you eat fruits and veggies, the more you end up eating. In other words, like if you tend to eat a fruit or a veggie at every meal at, and, and at your snack times, you're going to eat even more volume wise because you're in this habit. It's just, it's like, it's like your lifestyle. So I always tell parents, think about every eating occasion in the day and how you could get a fruit and or a veggie onto the table. So at breakfast, when my kids are, were younger, I had this um, motto at breakfast, personal motto. It was fruit first, meaning my boys come down in the morning, they're hungry. First thing that's on the table is not the bowl of cereal. That might be the second thing. The first thing is fruit. Kids love fruit. It's sweet. So it might be sliced strawberries, banana. It could be grapes. It could be oranges, depending what season it is. You name it starting with fruit. And then that the rest of the breakfast would be healthy. I might have a smoothie, a fruit smoothie. You said you like green smoothies. You could throw in some baby spinach leaves, add a little green hint to it. Um, you got your whole grain cereal. Maybe you make a parfait, whatever it might be with some you know Greek yogurt. Always think fruit first. And then when you're packing lunches, think about fruits and veggies. So maybe you're going to do, instead of a traditional sandwich, maybe you're going to do a pasta salad cold pasta salad in the lunchbox, and you might add veggies to that. Edamame beans, kids love those little edamame, maybe some carrot coins, maybe some broccoli florets, maybe you kind of blanch them, sort of cook them a little bit, soften them up. Um, and then afternoon snack, again, kids get home, they're starving, they love dips, put out guacamole or tzatziki or hummus, hummus is made with chickpeas, and chickpeas are technically a vegetable, beans are a vegetable. and you put out a bunch of cut-up veggies and they're dipping, dipping, dipping. So it's getting in this mindset. And then at dinner, don't just offer one veggie, offer two. Mm -hmm. So kids love choices. So if your kids, you're like, hey, I'd say to, my, to Josh and Simon, my boys, when they were younger, do you want the broccoli or the carrots or the broccoli and the asparagus or do you want both? And of course, they loved asparagus because you, know, you can eat that with your fingers. You don't have to use a knife and fork. Miss Manners says you can eat asparagus with your fingers, and they loved that. So always offering two veggies, give them the choice, and then hopefully they're going to want both. So it's this mindset of always having the fruits and veggies available, presenting them in fun and flavorful ways, and then it becomes this habit. But it's hard when you're on the go, right? So you go to the town pool or you're traveling to grandma's house or whatever over a holiday weekend, again, thinking, what are we going to pack? I got it. You know, fruit is like the ultimate portable fast food, right? There's packing along, dried fruit counts, frozen fruit, you know, so frozen fruits and veggies, canned, dried, fresh. I don't care how you eat it. Just get them in your kids' bellies. Get them in your belly too. I love, um, I love in the summertime when we travel, uh, getting fresh blueberries because they're like the perfect car snack. There's mm. nothing, no peel. There's nothing mm -hmm. there. Yeah, you pick up some blueberries off the floor, but it's it's a lot. Yeah, who cares? When we were when my girls were really little, we're kind of in a bad habit now. Now of when we're hungry for dinner, we have some chips. But when we were when when they were little, before dinner, when they were really hungry, that's when I would put out vegetables. Like I would just put out raw vegetables, carrots or green beans or snap peas or peas, whatever. Like I, I would just put that out before dinner. And it was great because they were so hungry then that they were just like, yes, give me food. <laughs> and they would eat all these vegetables. And then I wouldn't worry about it that much at dinner when they were little. Right. So that I mean, was like my secret 
And, and they're a captive audience, you know, yeah. get them, get them when they're hungry rather than, you know, having them eat like mindlessly chips or something, just get them with the, the fruits and veggies. And I will tell you the other really fun thing as kids get a little bit older, when they get onto Instagram, as they do, you look at what's trending. So for the longest time, smoothie bowls, which is like a thick smoothie, smoothie bowls oh, were trending. Like the and, acai bowls, right? Yes. Yes. And then you had... Um, and by the way, I do have a, a downloadable on my website. It's the Smoothie Bowl Coloring Cookbook. So it's smoothie bowl recipes along with these beautiful mandala coloring pages. So you can be coloring while your kids are cooking or vice versa. So I have a bunch of those coloring cookbooks on Liz's Healthy Table. So check them out. But smoothie bowls and then those Buddha bowls or the nourish bowls, those were trending. And now another- oh, is, that like, um, is that like rice or a grain and a whole bunch of, it's like kind yes. of like a salad with rice and grains or something. Yes. So you have like a grain and you have a protein and you have roasted veggies oftentimes, got to have avocado on there, you know, nuts, you, you name it. It's like hard boiled eggs, like anything goes. And that's fun. Like for kids, if you're doing sort of a make your own night. You could do a build your own pizza night or a build your own Buddha bowl night or a build your own stuffed baked potato night. You know, it's hands-on and it's interactive, which is another great way to get kids excited about vegetables. But the bowl meals are huge on Instagram. And now the biggest new trend are these snack boards or a cheese boards or appetizer boards, however you want to call them. It's a round board or it could be any shape, wooden board. And then you fill it with, with finger foods. You could have cheese, you could have dried apricots, you could do carrots and with hummus, um, crackers, whole grain crackers, like you name it, anything goes, Google it, you will see what I mean. It's like huge right now on Pinterest and Instagram. Kids can help make it. You could add like salami or some of those other deli meats, anything goes. I, I had a book group, I'm in a book group, and we were reading this book called Circe. It's about a Greek goddess great book, by the way. And so I was hosting the book group. And so for the appetizer, I Googled Greek inspired snack board and a ton of stuff came up and then I just created it. So I had all this like, you know, bell peppers and um, olives, you know, Greek olives. It was really fun. But for kids, it's doubly fun because they can help you make it. And then they just sort of nibble, nibble, nibble. You could do a snack board before dinner. You could do it as a dinner. It's, it's like, totally cool and so much fun and a great way to get those fruits and veggies into your kids' diets and especially use up leftovers too. Like open the fridge, half a bell pepper, slice it up, put it on a bowl, you know, in a bowl and then have your hummus or your other dips. So it's, it's you know, there's so many little strategies. The key is that it's colorful, it's fun, it's yummy. And then you get your kids hooked. Mm. And those habits make a, a big, they're, they're like a big deal, right? Like, so Back to my family. So when I when my first daughter was born, I was like a little paranoid about like, oh, I need her to eat, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up I ended up starting her on rice cereal, and then I gave her these like bunny crackers because I was like, I just want her to eat, you know. And I just was if she was hungry, I could give her the I would give her these bunny crackers. And then with daughter number two, I learned about, do you know about the baby led weaning sure. idea? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like, wow, this is a great idea. And it, this is kind of a bad name, but basically it's like you give your baby who's starting to eat uh, um, like a, a big whole steamed broccoli that's soft, but that they could like numb, they could kind of gum their way yep. through and, and <laughs> okay. on or a big piece of avocado or something like that. So we did some stuff like that with her. And I had learned about, I had gotten on my, my own green smoothie habit with her by then. So I took my little, like, I had the little baby bottles, you know, with the nipples. So I would, mm -hmm. like, get the bottle and I'd cut the top of the nipple off. So, she could, she was, so I have these pictures of her, like, chugging, like, a green smoothie from this baby bottle. That is so <laughs> funny and so healthy, too. But I'm worried that, like, it gave her a little bit more of a sweet tooth. Like, daughter number one now at 12 loves her carbs is like totally bread addicted but then that's like my mom too and um and daughter number two does eat a lot like she's actually loved sushi for a really long time mm -hmm. she's pretty adventurous but very kind of like sweet addicted so is that does that make sense am i reading too much into it 
Yeah, I think, you know, we all have our sort of personal preferences. My my older one, much more of, well, he's 24 and he lives in New York and he's like a survivalist in the sense that he'll eat anything that comes his way as long as he doesn't have to make it. He doesn't want to cook. The younger one, much more adventurous, cooks, uh, has a much more sophisticated palate in that he likes mm, blue cheese and he likes grapefruit, like more intense flavored foods. So I think, again, we're back to the genetic hardwiring. But if you do want to help your daughter sort of cut back a little bit on the, the sugar, I always find with me personally, when I'm eating lots of sugary sweets, once I start, I can't stop. So I will often just say, all right, no goodies. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. Because then at least it tames your, your sweet tooth a little bit. Or if I'm having a sweet tooth, I'll do the plain Greek yogurt with some crunchy whole grain cereal and fresh fruit. And if I need a little more sweetness, maybe drizzle with a bit of honey. And so I'm getting rid of the sugar, the added sugar from the yogurt, going with the plain. I have this like really um, you know, rich, creamy yogurt, and then the natural sweetness from the fruit. So that these there's little tricks, you know. You could do club soda, add a little bit of juice, maybe some mint, and then they get a little bit of the sweetness and all the fun fizz, but you start to kind of tamp Mm. down those taste buds because they really do get used to the sweet pretty quickly. It's addictive. I was definitely Mm -hmm. personally addicted to sugar because I used to go buy candy in my small town because I like live next to the, anyway, there was like candy store nearby and I would get baby, I would walk this dog, but, and I, I was sugar addicted for so long, like into college and, and actually my husband, he like laughs at me because we met when we were 20. And when I was in grad school in Boston, actually, um, I would like try to like um, chill out my sugar or I would try to chill out my like candy slash sugar craving. And I would like substitute with raisins, which are like even sweeter. Right? So like it would, didn't make any sense. And so I would like, so there, he would like find raisins like all over the house. <laughs> You're <laughs> like a little kid. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, I, I really worry about that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, research and, uh, about sugar now, right. And how, how dangerous it is. It's contributing to, to like heart disease and all kinds of things. Right? Well, well, let me back up and just say that raisins do not have any added sugar. They are naturally sweet. So kudos to you, you picked a good dried fruit. But it didn't help me like <laughs> it didn't help my you sweet. Wean. Yeah, because it's like it's still sweet. It's still sweet. naturally sweet. You know, the problem with all this added sugar in our food supply is that we end up just consuming too many calories. And when you're consuming, say, sugar sweetened beverages or lots of goodies, I call these sort of the indulgent refined carbohydrates, you know, the cookies, the pies, the cakes, you're eating that at the expense of not eating. The nutritious stuff. So not only are you consuming these sort of empty, useless calories, you're consuming probably more calories than you need, and you're not leaving room for the good stuff. So if you want to have a sweet treat, have a little bit of a sweet treat. You know, um, I was at the Culinary Institute of America, the CIA, a year ago out in California, and they talk a lot out there about the dessert flip, meaning at dessert time, have a big bowl of strawberries and a little bit of dark chocolate drizzle on top. That's a flip. Instead of having a big piece of chocolate cake with the tiny little blueberry or raspberry or strawberry on top, lots of berries, little drizzle of chocolate, uh, or a beautiful piece of dark chocolate, and then a big bowl of, of fruit. You know, even with sliced strawberries, you can drizzle. I know this sounds weird, but it's super yummy. Drizzle a little bit of balsamic vinegar and a tiny bit of pepper, you know, sweet and savory. So it's that dessert flip. You're still satisfying the sweet tooth. You might have some nuts like almonds with a little bit of dark chocolate and then some berries. So think about, yeah, I still want to have my sweets, but I'm going to flip it, you know, and just make it a little bit healthier. It's like a portion thing, right? Portion control when it comes to to the desserts. So we, we, you know, we don't want to be consuming all these empty calories. Again, it's at the expense of all the good stuff that we do want to be eating. But it, so it's interesting because like there's, um, you know, I I feel very torn in a lot of ways because like I see like I don't I don't want my kids eating 
junky foods and and like tons of sugar and you know they ask me when they go to the pool can we get this thing or whatever and it seems like every single like every two weeks there's a holiday where somebody has bags of candy out and i want to have them have a moderate you know have this kind of moderate relationship with sweets and things like that but then again i i feel worried about like um i don't want to demonize any foods like i want to say this is bad because I feel like that's such a, that whole labeling of things as good or bad turns into labeling ourselves as I'm good or I'm bad when I eat these things. When I eat well, I'm good. When I don't eat well, I'm bad. Or I'm, you know, that, that whole thing is like a hugely problematic. And I, 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 it's like a hard kind of middle path to walk. It is. And, and, and you're totally right. You know, we live in this society where, unhealthy foods are so easy to access. They're everywhere. You know, you even go into like Joanne Fabrics to buy fabric and you're checking out. There's like this huge array of candy. It's everywhere. And in school, there's parties and birthdays and it it goes on and on. And after school, when the kids are independent and, you know, they're going, walking home with their friends from school and then they walk into the little, you know, you know, I don't know what you have in your area, but it might be like a CVS or a, um, you know, gas station, mini mart or something. And again, more junky food. So, you know, it's this fine line, you know, as, as parents, we are the ones in control of what we're buying at the supermarket and what we're stocking in our home pantries. And so if you keep your home cleaner, if you will. So maybe you decide we're not going to buy soft drinks. We don't need to have soft drinks. We've got club soda and juice. We'll mix the two and make our own little sodas. Or if you say, when I buy cereal, I'm going to buy mostly the whole grain cereal and maybe on occasion more of a, you know, refined cereal, or we're going to do whole wheat bread, whatever you decide that you want to stock in your home, that's what you do. And then when you're out and about, you know, your kids go to a ball game, you're not going to say you can only eat the air popped popcorn. Well, it's probably not even for sale while you're at the ball game, but you know, the peanuts maybe are a better choice. So keep your home, control your home. And then what's outside of the home, just do your best to guide your kids without being judgy and without being punitive. And it's a fine line, you know? And the other thing too, is just to keep our, keep kids active, you know, keep them moving because then they're burning calories and they're doing what kids should do, right? They're playing and they're burning off all that energy. Um, I remember years ago, in our, I live in Lexington, Massachusetts, and I was just so shocked when my kids would play soccer on the weekends with the quote-unquote snacks the parents would bring at, at halftime and after the games. I'm like, it's 10 in the morning. We don't need to be eating donuts. And I got to get my kid home and give him lunch. I don't want him filling up on you know, Rice Krispie treats out here. Not to mention, it makes a big mess and a lot of litter. And we, I worked with the soccer club in our town. And we came up with a fruit and water only guideline, which meant if you're a coach, you say to the parents, hey, we'd love to have sliced oranges for halftime. And then after the game's over, we're just going to send everybody home. Kids don't, they played for an hour, if that, you know, they don't need to eat after they play. And please, if you're going to bring a beverage, just please bring water. And it worked out really well because it was made the parents' lives easier. And then the kids could just run off and do their thing without it being this whole junk fest. So these are ways you can actually work with your community to say, I can control what's happening in my household. And now I can control what's happening out of the household a little bit too. You could talk to a preschool teacher or an elementary school teacher and say, gee, did you ever think about doing um, food-free parties instead? Where maybe we just do an art project or we get extra recess instead of sitting there eating yet another you know, cupcake. So it's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing because you're bringing about all this good change in the community around you. And then you're setting up your dream home, you know, in terms of what's in your pantry, because you're the, you're the, the ruler of your kitchen, right? Nobody tells you what you have to, you know, buy at the supermarket. You have that control. Yeah. Yeah. Actually in my own community, uh, and just to give an example of this, this what exactly we are talking about, Liz, like this is completely possible. My girls went to, um, we have in our community, like a summer co-op where, where the kids in the community can all go for three hours in the morning and it's lots of fun. And I guess it used to be that they would give parents the option of like just providing snack for one day. Cause it's, it was sort of loosey goosey. I don't know. But then anyway, so snack would be random and strange. And there was this one day, 
there was this one day I got, I went there and it was around snack time and all these kids are outside and this 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 mom from the community is giving them <laughs> Klondike bars and Pepsi's or Mountain Dews Mm-mm. and I was like <laughs> are you kidding me like my, my daughters are like six and three like, and I was yeah, like on. <laughs> oh my god you're giving them like caffeinated soda like you're giving them Mountain Dew like oh yeah yeah like face palm like what is happening so I volunteered and now I buy all the snacks for the whole summer co-op. Way to go. And they get Way to go. Thomas and chips, salsa and chips, mm-hmm. they get cheese sticks. Anyway, it's it was it's something you can do. You can go and, and make some of these changes. And but it was a few years of me being like, um, how who decides on these snacks? What are we doing? You know, yeah. Can we make a change here. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good success story. And you know, the way I think about it too, is that if you walk into say a a school, an elementary school or a middle or high school, and you know, these kids are learning math and they're learning English and history and all this, and there's this curriculum and you hope you live in that town and you hope that your school has the best curriculum because it's the best thing for your kid's mind, right? Mm -hmm. But keep moving, move, keep going in terms of what's best for your kids. Recess is best for your kids. Healthy school lunches are best for your kids. There should be the best. Our kids deserve the best. The, they are these little beings who we are molding and shaping and nurturing you know, through their childhood. And so for me, I want the best curriculum, but I want the best food and I want the best playground and I want, I want it to be the best. So we shouldn't just stop at the curriculum. And if you get in that mindset, then you realize as a parent, wow, there's like so much more to than just you know, reading and writing. This is the whole child. So when you, somebody's giving your kid sodas and Klondike bars and candy, you're like, whoa, what, why are you doing that? You, you know, you're, you're not giving my kid comic books to read all day in school. Like We should give them good nutrition too. It's one big package, right? It's not one without the other. So are your boys uh, vegetable, big vegetable eaters now? Mm-hmm. Well, Josh, the older one, again, will eat whatever is placed in front of him because he will, he's so thankful when he visits me that there's all this good food. And when he's out of my grasp, I, I fear he eats way too many sandwiches because he's like a working guy. And then my younger one, Simon, he went off to college as a freshman, University of Vermont. And he comes home over Christmas and I, this year ago, well, half a year ago. So I have made like meatballs and like all this like hearty food. Cause I'm like, my, my boy's coming home. I got to feed him. He looks at me. He's like, oh, I don't eat meat anymore. I'm like, you're going to eat it now, buddy. I just spent like a whole day making these meatballs. <laughs> but he, he, you know, didn't love the dorm food and he felt like the meat was a little too much of a mystery meat situation. So he and his buddies were like pretty much plant-based. They were more or less vegetarians. So I'd consider him, he eats everything, but he eats a lot of veggies. He's a great eater. Like I'll give him hummus and he'll just sit there with sliced cucumbers and carrots and just go to town. Now, if a bag of chips was sitting there, like baked tortilla chips, he'd grab those too. But when I put the veggies out and the one food he's eating now constantly that he never used to eat is avocados, my favorite food. He used to eat guacamole, but he wouldn't just like eat avocado. And now I give him a half an avocado, puts a little dressing on it, gets a spoon out and just goes to town. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're really good eaters. I'm really lucky, but they do like to be cooked for. And I kind of wish we'd, well, the younger one does cook quite a bit, but when I was, when my boys were younger, I was testing a lot of recipes for my cookbooks and my blog was rocking along at the time with lots of recipes and So I was always like in this crazy mom like mode, you know, cooking, cooking, and I didn't include them as much as I should have. That's like a that's a little mommy regret of mine. Mm -hmm. And now I always say to parents, get your kids cooking. It is the best thing. Because then when they they're off on their own, then they'll know how to prepare all those fruits and veggies, how to make that smoothie, right? Because you've done it with them. And it's also a nice help for you too, because you know, dinner time can be really crazy. And isn't it nice when the kids are helping? So get the kids involved as much as possible. Every they do dishes. They do dishes really well. And I it's like, all right, I have done everything for dinner tonight. You need to do the dishes. So they're great at and then Josh was in a fraternity. And I think as a as a little plebeian there, they made them work for the brothers who lived, you know, off campus. And I think he did a lot of dishes. 
at the time. I think that's really where he learned to do dishes. <laughs> Quite good at it. My girls are not that great at doing dishes yet. <laughs> I wish they were. I wish they're a little better. Um, for the listener who is wanting, like maybe you have young kids and you're wanting your kids to uh, get involved, like Liz is talking about in the kitchen. Uh, a great resource I'd love to recommend is the Four Small Hands. It used to be a catalog, but it's foursmallhands.com. And now, and they have, it's all this Montessori uh, materials for young kids, and but they're real tools for small hands. Mm. And so they have like a little wavy cutter there that you can hold with two hands and push down to cut carrots or cucumbers or whatever. So they're, it's really pretty safe for like even a two or three year old to use. So um, there's my, my uh, resource for you. <laughs> I like that. So four small hands, F-O-R. Four yeah. small hands. Yeah. 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 Giving the kids a little tools of the trade is always good. Or, or even like if you have a little one, I love mason jars with a tight fitting lid. You could have them help you make a salad dressing and they kind of shake it up, give a kid a whisk and, and a bowl and they go to town. Mm. They can crack eggs. You could just teach them all these basics. And as they get older, you know, they can do more and more. But it, I do believe strongly that when you involve your kids in every process, you know, it could be meal planning grocery shopping. You know, I have a supermarket scavenger hunt on my website under the freebies section. You know, you could take, and I have one for the farmer's market too. And so you can take your child to the market and then have them help you, you know, with, I've got all these fun clues. It's all for healthy stuff. And then they run around the market looking for the kale and the berries and the eggs and all the good stuff, the beans, super cute. So get them helping it at every level, you know, cooking, setting the table, cleaning, you know, whatever it takes. And, and then they're more excited to try new foods. doesn't mean it'll work every time. They, you know, they still might be like, oh, I don't want to eat that. But, you know, just keep introducing those foods over and over. Change things up. You know, my boys, you know, I was saying how Simon did not like avocado, but he liked guacamole. So make guacamole. Or maybe they like sweet potato, you know, diced into little pieces and roasted versus like mash. So just, you know, play around a little bit till you find the the veggies they like and the preparations that they like. And, and it's true that like, it takes a lot of tastings of things. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, I mean, I always think about this too. Like sometimes I, like I, what I learned at some point is that we give, give up too early, right? Like, um, you know, I mean, for instance, like no one tasted beer or coffee the first time mm-hmm. and was like, yum, this is I great. You know, like, no, <laughs> right. no, that happened to no person. So like it took, it takes some exposure to a food to be, make that taste to be palatable. Right. And it's, it's very much the same with kids. and vegetables. Right. I and mean, we all have different taste buds. So if I like, I, I don't like broccoli, Rob or Rabe, however you people say it differently, but I don't like, that's like the one veggie I don't like. So that's okay. You know, my husband doesn't like cucumbers. That's okay. I'll, I'll more for me, right. I'll celebrate that. But you want to try those foods over and over because it does take a while for taste buds to get used to that new flavor. I mean, if, if, if we as humans accepted every new flavor, like right off the bat, especially more of that bitter stuff, like the coffee and the beer, then we probably would never have survived as a species. And so it's, we're, we're kind of bi- biologically wired. We like sweet because breast milk is sweet, right? That's like the first thing a child consumes. And so we're hardwired to like sweet but we're not hardwired to like sour or bitter. So it does take some time to get used to those flavors. So definitely don't give up. And, you know, even little kids, you know, if you think about babies, they're in this growth spurt, right? So they eat, 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 eat. And people will say to me, well, my child turned two and suddenly she wouldn't eat as much anymore. Well, yeah, that's because her growth has slowed down. So her appetite has slowed down. So go with it. You know, don't worry about it. Let the child kind of guide you through that. Let their appetites guide. It's really, you know, your job to provide the food and the time of day you're going to eat and the location where you're going to eat. It's your child's job to decide how much of those foods they want to eat. You know, they might be hungry. They might not be hungry. You can't force it on them. So you've prepared this beautiful dinner. You're eating at six o'clock and you're at the kitchen table. Job's done. And now your child is, you know, picking and choosing. And the other thing you can do is that when you're serving dinner, you know, as parents, we tend to like to plate up everybody's food. Here, Johnny, here, Susie, here's your food. Well, if you were at a dinner party, 
And, you know, your hostess was like, here's your dinner. And you get like this plate of food and you're thinking, my gosh, I can't eat all that food she plopped on my plate, especially the broccoli rob. I don't want to eat that. I'd rather it be served family style so I can pick and choose what I want to eat and how much. Mm. And it's the same with families. If you present all the food at dinner family style and everybody's picking and choosing and role modeling, all this good behavior, you know, older brother, or older sister's taking the broccoli, little brother follows suit. It's much less stressful for kids when it's presented family style versus plated. Because when you plate the food, you're saying, you need to eat this food and here's how much you need to eat. No, 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 that's their job. Our job, remember, was to make the food and present it and the time of day and the location. It's their job to decide what and how much. And so I, I think the family style is a great strategy and it's super fun. And it makes mealtime less of a battle, you know, for parents who say, oh, dinner is such a stressful time for my family, really takes the pressure off when it's family style. Would you agree with, we We followed, we had a rule in our house that is, um, you don't have to eat it, but you must taste it because we wanted them to like develop that palate. What, what would you say to that list? I would say, we'd like you to taste it. Mm -hmm. We're going to taste everything and we'd like for you to taste everything. If a child is really resistant then that could turn into a battle and can be really stressful. You know, with my first book, it was called The Mom's Guide to Meal Makeovers. And my second book was called No Wine with Dinner, W-H-I-N-E. Mm -hmm. One of the tips we talked about in both books was the no thank you bite, where everybody takes a bite and they could say thank you or no thank you. That was really colorful and pretty, but no thank you. You don't say, ew, yuck, I don't want that. You just, you know, try it and say thanks or no thanks. And I, years ago, I had a mom email us and say, I did the no thank you bite. And my child refused to do it. And I made him sit at the table for hours and he cried and it was such a nightmare. And I was like, oh gosh, oh no. So my point being that a tip that might work for you and your family may not work for the family next door. So pick and choose, you know, figure out the strategies that resonate with your kids. And if your child is going to freak out and get upset because they're forced to taste something, then that strategy may not be the best for that child. So I would encourage it. I wouldn't make it a hard and fast rule. Mm -hmm. Like the rules that I think are really enforceable when it comes to mealtime are things like being polite. You know, if you say, ew, yuck, I don't want that, then I'm sorry, you have to leave the table. And that was always my rule because I knew if Josh, the older son, said that about dinner, Simon, the little brother, wouldn't eat. So I'd say to Josh, if you diss, you're dismissed. And, and trust me, that's, that's a scary threat. I don't want to be dismissed from the table. Be polite. I think that's a great rule where everybody clears their plate. That's an awesome rule. It keeps it positive. Everybody's engaged and involved. It's respectful. But, I, but forcing or saying you must eat everything on your plate, you know, that the whole clean play club, ooh, that's so 50s. You know, hopefully we're not doing that anymore. Because again, maybe Johnny's not hungry that night and maybe Susie is starving. So, you know, you don't want to force withhold, you know, none of that. Just keep it positive. Keep it fun. Oh my God. I remember sitting in front of like steamed plain Brussels sprouts being. Oh, dreadful. Oh, at the Ugh. table being forced to sit there like, oh, and just, yeah. Like why, why would you ever just boil summer squash by itself? Like It's cruel. Oh, it's, it's, it's unfair like to the vegetable. It's a slimy, sad vegetable. It's <laughs> so much more potential. Than that. <laughs> like, hello, roasted Brussels sprouts. Remember they had their moment a few years ago. Mm. It was so popular. You know, I was talking trends before, like roasted Brussels sprouts, huge trend. Roasted cauliflower, huge trend. You roast vegetables and they get naturally like caramelized and sweet and they're so tender and yummy. You boil them to death. Nobody's going to want to eat that. Like, I don't want to eat that. Whatever I want to eat, like I would never put anything on the table that I don't want to eat. And so think of it that way, right? So there's, there's so many, thankfully we have the internet now and we can Google these things. And there's just so many good recipes out there that really do, you know, bring fruits and vegetables, especially to a whole new level. So much more flavorful than those yucky Brussels sprouts. Thank you. Oh, great fruit and vegetable chefs that have shown us the way. <laughs> uh, we get well, a star. Well, Liz, um, I really appreciate this. I feel like there's so much, many things that we can take away from this. I imagine the listener might 
go back and listen again and see what they find uh, the next time from from listening to this. Um, yeah, this is this is great. I love the from the easy build your own nights to the roast your vegetables, mm-hmm. and that's great. We, we've, uh, hit the, we've hit the tip of the iceberg. There's just so many so many great ideas out there. Yeah, yeah, and you have your podcast. What's the name of your podcast so people can find it? My show is called Liz's Healthy Table, and it's all about healthy family meals. And so I have a lot of guests on who are cookbook authors. They might be chefs, dietitians, and sometimes I do my own episodes, but it's all really with this goal of getting healthy meals on the family table. So I hope people will check it out and tune in. Awesome. And thank you so much for the work you've been doing for so many years and sharing with the world. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. It was fun. Really good to be here. Thank you so much for listening. Her advice is so tried and true and common sense. And it's something we I, I need reminders of for sure. It's not easy to, uh, to eat well, I think, in our world. Uh, the whole, I'm talking about getting more fruits and vegetables, I certainly, you know, I certainly we need to work on that, I think, a little in our family as our kids have gotten older. I hope that you got something out of this episode too. If you did, feel free to hit me up on Facebook or on Instagram at Mindful Mama Mentor and let me know. Please uh, share the podcast if you think it'll be useful for other people and if it's been useful for you. And I want to remind you that you can join me in real life at the Mindful Mama Spring Retreat that's on March 21st. And you can learn all about it and sign up at mindfulmamamentor.com slash retreat. We'll be having a lovely vegetarian lunch there <laughs> as well. Um, but yeah, that's on March 21st. You can, there are limited spots available. So please go right away to mindfulmamamentor.com slash retreat and grab your spot. And then we can hang out in real life and we can have a hug. It'll be lovely. I look forward to that so much. So I'm wishing you a healthy, happy, and wonderful week. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. I know that there are so many podcasts to listen to. There's so much out there in the world, and I appreciate you choosing the Mindful Mama podcast. I appreciate you choosing to hang out and spend this time with me. It makes a big difference uh, to me that we get to connect, and I hope it makes a big difference to you too. You always let me know, but I wish you peace. I wish you joy. I wish you lots of wonderful things in your week. And I will be right back in your inbox uh, next Tuesday. All right. Have a great week, my friend. Namaste.